Shukriya for making the time, Stella Ji. So I thought we would start by uh, if you could share your memories from childhood. What is the first memory you have of the even the idea of non-violence or the concept and the practice, any aspect of it? Well, I was uh, born and brought up at Phoenix Settlement. And daily we used to have prayers uh, according to Papuji's, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, prayer services. And every day we used to chant the 11 verse. Hmm. And it starts with Ahimsa, Sathya's day. So Ahimsa was the first word. And uh, from early childhood, I can't remember exactly when, but I was always, uh, you know, a person who used to ask questions. So <laughs> questioning was something that I was always um, fond of. So I asked, what does Ahimsa mean? What do well, she said that Ahimsa uh, means violence. Mm -hmm. And Ahimsa is uh, being peaceful, being uh, non-violent. And uh, so as a little child, it was about physical violence. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, um, you know, anything deeper than that. Mm -hmm. But physical violence against everything. Mm -hmm. Your plants, nature, animals, and everything. And there was a little story, uh, you know, when I was uh, a child. Now, Phoenix Ashram is quite a big ashram. And there used to be many families living there. And one day, um, a wild cat, a little baby wild cat, came to the farm and was sitting on a tree just opposite uh, our home. And uh, some of the people in the neighborhood came up and they said, you know, this wild cat is a dangerous animal and it can harm you and it can harm other people and we have to kill it. Mm -hmm. And there was no one on that particular day. My parents, the whole family had left the house. I was alone at home. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they came with their guns and everything and I said, no, we don't allow guns here and you can't kill, you know. But then they kept telling me how dangerous this cat is and that if they don't kill it, it's going to kill other people. And so eventually I said, okay, you know, shoot it. And as a little, I think I must have been about seven or something, that very young age. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay, kill it. Mm -hmm. And then my parents came and they heard the story. And so my mom said, but you know, I told you about Ahimsa. How can you allow him to kill the cat? And uh, then I told her that they said it would be harmful to us. Uh, my mom said, no, it was a baby cat. And how is it going to harm anybody? So, um, you know, I began to think about it. She told me and, and it worried me. And um, instead of condemning me, punishing me, or even telling the other people, you know, who had come there, anything. She just explained everything to me. And I think I really appreciated that. But then my conscience, you know, worried me. And so I asked her, how can God forgive me for this and all that? And she said, well, you must think about how you forgive yourself. And uh, at that age, I undertook a two-day fast. I began to learn because when you have that experience, mm. it uh, you know it sort of helps you to internalize. Yes, yes. What ahimsa really means. Yeah. Later on, as a teenager, when one and in one's teens, one tends to be quest more questioning, rebellious. Did you ever have doubts about the concept of ahimsa? 
Well, I didn't have doubts, no. But uh, growing up, you know, when um, I was much older and I saw what uh, Nelson Mandela and them went through and the fact that he had to take to violence mm -hmm. because of the conditions and I experienced those conditions. I mean, I went to a university where we were not allowed into the premises of the university. We had to be in another building mm -hmm. outside in the city and the lecturers would come and lecture to because us. Because of the, your brown skin? Yeah. So we weren't allowed to even enter, mm -hmm. not get books from there, not be seen on that premises at all. And all those things uh, sort of, um, you know, they, they do inflame. Of course. You begin to feel, you know, antagonism. Yeah. But um, we, because uh, at Phoenix, we had people of all races coming. So it wasn't a racial antagonism. It was an antagonism against the system. Mm. And that's another lesson, you know, that Gandhiji said, hate the deed, not the doer. Mm. And so that was always uh, in my mind. But then I could understand, you know, even Nelson Mandela, when he uh, took to violence, he said that we should, um, you know, try never to kill people, mm. that we should, uh, you know, attack. Uh, installations and things like that. Mm. What is your earliest memory of Mandela? Because you, was he already in jail by the time you were in college or uh, was he uh, free? And He was free and the earliest memory I have is when we all you know, used to just uh, hero worshipping. He was known as the Black Pimpernel because at that time he was underground and he was going around and, mm -hmm. and we used to really feel what a great person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we used to really admire the fact that he could evade the police. Harila Kaka, my uncle, mm -hmm. when Gandhiji was beaten up, he asked my grandfather, so you talk about Ahimsa and if I were with you, what would you expect me to do? And his answer was, well, practice ahimsa as far as you can. But if you if you see somebody and your father, you know, in being uh, attacked like that, then you have to use force to save him. What about the other aspects of the movement for against apartheid? Because uh, not everyone was so nuanced in their understanding of violence as Mandela. And as a part of that movement, how did you grapple with those other factors, which were perhaps more uh, unqualified in their use of violence? We were taught that um, we tackle, um, you know, installations and our casualties must be at the minimum. So no soft targets. Mm -hmm. Soft targets are places where there are many people. And like my earliest uh, memory is of Harris. Harris was a person, a young man, a white man, who was part of this underground, uh, you know, group. And he placed a bomb at a railway station and at the time he placed the bomb, the bomb, uh, you know, station was completely um, empty. There was nobody there. But as he was coming out, an old lady went and sat next to the packet. And that worried him so much that he immediately went to a telephone and phoned the police that uh, there is a bomb on the station and you should evacuate people thinking that you know he's just warning them so that this lady would move out but that got him arrested and he was hanged a young man 
who, you know, but it shows the compassion. And this is the kind of people who were part of the underground movement at the time when Mandela started this. If you read Ram Fisher's story, you'll see that they constantly spoke about casualties. No casualties in our operations. Mm. But at some stage, whilst um, in exile, there were people who began to say, no, we must tackle soft targets now. Mm. And so in the later years, somehow people were then, you know, placing bombs in busy places and doing that. And I felt that that was a very heartless um, thing to do mm. because innocent people were dying. Mm. And that was not what we were, mm. Mm. you know, um, sort of supporting. Right, right. So definitely in my thinking and many other people as well, that part of it was not part of the communist ideology. It came from some way, we don't know exactly how, who gave that uh, instruction and why certain people did what they did mm. in the name of communists. Mm. I know with other bodies, you know, the other political organizations, they had no qualms about who they killed. Mm. Within the communist movement, mm. the empathy, that uh, compassion for people was mm. always there. Mm. But within the movement, as a part of that movement, were you able to raise your voice against those who were indulging in this violence? Well, we were not part of the external wing. Uh, and we had no uh, sort of, um, you know, discussions or access to the external wing. Okay. We could only uh, see what happens inside mm. the country. And mm. we were, um, we did everything on a non-violent scale inside the country. We means the ANC. Uh, the, you know, the mass democratic movement, right. the UDF, because the ANC was banned. At the right, time. right. So we organized as NIC, mm -hmm. which was an Indian organization, but we also worked closely with the other uh, communities. We had defense units. Mm -hmm. And defense is a different thing. Mm -hmm. You defend yourself as I said about Papaji. Mm. So defense is a completely different matter. Yeah, matter. And if in self-defense you have to, you know, use violence, then that is acceptable. But not, um, you know, you don't start the violence and yeah. you yeah. limit your killing to the lowest possible yeah. denominator. Yeah. Can you please share your understanding of Mandela's shift from considering conditional violence to be uh, permissible to his uh, yes. almost Gandhian uh, choice of non-violence? Uh, I would like to hear your uh, understanding of that transition. So uh, Mr. Mandela himself says in uh, his book, that whilst in Robben Island, he began to read widely and he read a number of Gandhiji's books. He also read uh, other philosophers and so on. And he thought that if we can negotiate a settlement, and there were two things that, uh, you know, were instrumental. Uh, one was that um, we were not fighting an external enemy you know, in a person from outside another country. The people who were oppressing us were South African people. They were there to stay. They had no other country. They were not going to leave the country. So we have to work out a way to live together. And you can't eliminate a whole big population of Africans, you can't wish them away. 
they will need to stay. And uh, so we've got to do something to change their mentality, the way they thought, and to, you know, because they believed in this Calvin Calvinistic notion that they are the chosen race and that everybody else, the non-white people, were there to serve them. And this was a belief, a spiritual belief that they had. And so Mandela felt that we have to change this. And he saw, you know, that other people were beginning to do this. The mass democratic movement mm -hmm. in the country was beginning to gain power. Externally, we had a lot of support from the anti-apartheid movements. And the time had come when that change was possible. There was mm. enough pressure. Mm. And so that, uh, you know, thinking about it strategically um, in terms of um, his own ideology, mm. he began to think that maybe, you know, starting to talk would be a better way. The business people went out and had discussions with them. The Afrikaner community went out and had discussions with them. Mm -hmm. So many people were consulted in that process. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, inside the country, Nelson Mandela started this process of negotiations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they had certain basic, you know, that I'm not going to be the first one to be released. Mm -hmm. You release all the political prisoners, you bring back all the exiles, then you release me. Mm -hmm. Until then, I'm right here in the prison. Right. Not going right. To go out. So after the end of apartheid, there was a truth and reconciliation process and commission. And many scholars have suggested that that may have enabled South Africa to prevent uh, a potential civil war <clears throat> after the end of apartheid. Uh, but now, 25 years later, looking back uh, from a lens of nonviolence, how would you assess briefly the exercise of truth and reconciliation? Both it's it's imperative at that time, and but looking back also. Well, I think, you know, the, uh, there was a lot of uh, work done during the truth and reconciliation uh, period. Mm. But um, I think there were flaws as well. Mm. The first flaw, I would say, is the question of amnesty. Mm. Who do you give amnesty to and who you don't give? Amnesty so that was, uh, you know, a big question mm -hmm. because there were certain people who had tortured and killed so many people. And um, whilst they confessed, they didn't say that the orders that they received were from Boda or Foster, someone else in power. So, you know, it's like um, when you imprison a soldier, but what about the general who gave the command? The soldier was just obeying somebody. So this is what happened, you know, at that level of command, who were the people behind that violence mm. and behind what happened? Mm. So that section was left mm. un, um, you know, touched. Mm. And so many people felt that, look, uh, we are suffering as a result of apartheid. And apartheid was not just about discrimination, but it was economic discrimination and deprivation. Mm. They took away the 1913 Land Act, deprived the majority of the African people from having access to land. And that was a huge thing that uh, the, uh, you know, the apartheid government did by depriving them of the land. So it, 
taking away the land meant taking away their livelihood. And so um, there were no reparations. So on the one hand, there's amnesty. On the other hand, what about the reparations? There was money given, but what does 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, what does it do to a person? How does it compensate for hundreds of years of oppression? And how long can money last? Mm. What happens to their children? They, and as time went, they found that uh, the children of the victims of uh, apartheid still suffered. They didn't have good schools. They didn't have access to health facilities. They didn't have homes, whilst the perpetrators were still living it up. They had uh, beautiful cars, beautiful homes. Their children were happy going to posh private schools and everything. So there was that disparity, and that disparity remains in South Africa. The inequality is the biggest problem. If we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission beginning to say that, okay, if you admit to this, what are you prepared to give? Not outside, you know, not asking international community to pay something towards the reparation but asking the perpetrators, mm -hmm. come and share your wealth with the people. Be prepared to give and equalize, you know. Yeah. Instead of that, we gave them the opportunity to continue mm -hmm. their lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the lifestyle of the victims deteriorated. Mm -hmm. That is the problem even today. Gee. Uh, some people would argue that this undermines the concept of ahimsa, that because uh, globally the concept of Truth and Reconciliation Commission was seen as a way of, uh, uh, it was a non-violence approach. Yes. And uh, so today in a world that is torn with so much conflict, in light of these experiences, what would you today say about nonviolence, ahimsa, as both a concept and then as a practicable ideal? I think it's the most practicable, uh, you know, ideal in the world. And today's world needs ahimsa. Um, when we understand ahimsa, there are three things that are very important for ahimsa. Number one is that it's not about, uh, you know, overpowering a person or defeating a person. It's about change, changing the person. So that's the first concept. The second concept is it's about love and reconciliation. So you don't hate the person. You show them love and you try to change their mindsets so that they begin to do something, you know, change. So they uh, move away from the selfishness to uh, beginning to see what other people are suffering. And the third thing is that you can only teach a person. Gandhiji always said that you cannot teach a person something if you are not doing what you are teaching. Mm -hmm. So you can only teach through your own practice and your own example. And he, Mandela did that. He went to Mrs. Foster and uh, had tea with her, a person who would never have thought of entertaining a black person. This was in their psyche. But Mr. Mandela went there and broke down that you know, psyche in the person to say, here I am. I'm a human being. I'm just like you. Maybe I have a different color skin, but there's no difference. And, you know, when she saw, and they, and the Africana people, the, the same people who practiced apartheid, they love Mandela. 
And if everyone, you know, we, it's okay for us, the population, to say, well, Mandela was a sellout, and, you know, as we do with Papuji, just uh, call them names. You don't learn anything. You only learn if you see what they did, how they behaved, and how they were able to achieve what they achieved. And so to see that in, in practical terms, it's not written anywhere, you won't find it in books, but you find it in the emotion. And that is what Mandela did, and that is what Gandhiji said. So if you practice those three things, that do it practically, it's not about defeating anyone, and it's done with love. You change with love. Mm. Those three things, mm. if we did that, Mm. the world would be a different place. Yes. So one last quick question is that many people are stopped from doing this because they have fear in their heart. A fear that if they walk this path that they will be victimized and somebody else will benefit over them. Uh, can you share some advice on how those who experience this fear should deal with it. Okay, the first thing is, you know, fear is in the mind. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we have learned this from experience. You think about torture, you think about all those things, and you begin to fear. Mm -hmm. But when you get there, you somehow get the strength to confront. And so the fear in the mind magnifies the situation much more than the situation actually is fearful or that's the first point the second point is that in my view it's not about fear fear is also spread by other people they the people who feel that we have to instigate others to do things and so they put fear into you they not only put fear, but they, in, uh, alongside fear is hatred. And they spread hate. And when you begin to spread hate, it, uh, anger comes into the, into the equation. And anger and hatred are what drives you to do the most barbaric thing. And you, you, you become subhuman or you know you lose your humanity mm. so the thing is that we in this world who have some power who have some knowledge need to put to to begin to uh, spread the message of love the message of uh, you know humanity what is compassion what is humanity and if we do that, you find a different kind of society developing. Mm -hmm. But what we see in modern society is hatred, mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. Everybody is walking around with so much of hate, so much of anger. And for as long as we do that, there is going to be terrible violence and all kinds of violence, whether it's against women, children, mm -hmm. community, Mm -hmm. All kinds of violence are perpetuated by hatred, anger, and um, fear, which is instigated. That's right. Mm -hmm. In closing, can you just tell us briefly what you're working on these days and your role as an elder in the ANC? Well, this is what I'm trying to do, to, to teach people that we shouldn't be angry. We shouldn't hate people. Mm -hmm. That uh, people do things because of circumstances. Let's try and change people. Let's try to, through our own example, begin to lead a different kind of life. Mm -hmm. And of course, there has to be justice. Economic and social justice is important. 
And so we work towards uplifting communities that are suffering from economic uh, oppression, from exploitation and so mm -hmm. on. But also trying to say that stop exploiting. There is, a, we, we've done away with slavery, but there's a different type of slavery still continuing. Where we find that people are being exploited daily and nobody understands their suffering. So we need to become more conscious of the suffering of the other mm. and begin to do something about it. Mm. And that famous quote, don't, teach, don't give people fish, teach them to fish. And that I think is the most important thing to, mm. for people to have dignity, mm. to be able to do things with their own hands mm. and be able to become self-sustaining, self-sufficient. Mm. That is the message Bapuji sent with Sargo there. And um, this is what I'm trying to spread. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you.